Get ready to hear some good lessons this morning. We got um, we have a bang up lineup for you, if I can say it that way. We, we've got John Watson from Indianapolis going to be giving a lesson on the just and the unjust. We got Brent Bischel going to be giving a lesson on the Song of Moses, I believe, from uh, Deuteronomy 32 and Exodus 15, if I'm not mistaken. So looking forward to hearing Brother Brent Bischel from California. And then we got Hogarth. We're going to have to suffer through him now. And Holder's going to be giving a lesson on uh, the common objections that people pose against realized eschatology, that all things have been fulfilled, and he's going to delve into some of the common objections that are made there. Looking forward to all these lessons, and if you would pay attention, if you would take notes, if you would listen, I'll guarantee you're going to hear some things that will help you, that will help us all to understand these things better. We have good, qualified men that are here that are dedicated to the truth. They're honest people. They're honest men. And I don't think you're going to find a better group of people anywhere in the world, anywhere, that I think, uh, than what we have right here this morning. And, uh, I, I, and I want to take just a moment and give my personal thanks and appreciation to everyone, to the ladies cooking, to all of our congregation. It's been a long, hard work for us getting things prepared. We don't have everything down perfect. We've missed a few things. Uh, you know, please be uh, graceful with us and uh, thankful for all those who have traveled so far. We have folks here from Missouri and Tennessee and Texas and California and Florida. Uh, thanks to Holger and Scott and, I mean, just everyone who has been here to put this together. God bless you all. John Watts is going to be the speaker of the hour. I met John, oh, I guess about a year ago. And uh, as things like this will do, it has brought many of us together for the first time. And it, that's what God's Word is designed to do. If we will delve into God's Word and be honest, it will bring unity and not division. And so there's some of us here that would have never come together any other way that are now finding unity in the gospel of Jesus Christ. John is an honest man. He's a good man. He's willing to stand for the truth. He stood in the face of great opposition. Uh, far beyond what most people even know and understand. Uh, he has stood against his whole family, his community, um, uh, denominationalism, uh, non-institutional, mainstream, you name it. He has just stood and weathered the storm. He's still standing. And like Brother Holger Neubauer said some time ago, we're not going to give up. We're not going to back up. We're not going <coughs> to shut up. And Brother John Watson is a good example of that. He's got a great manner about him. He's very patient. Unlike me, I, I want to go for the jugular right now. Uh, he, he's willing to, uh, to deal with it a little bit more uh, compassionately, if you will, than, than me. But uh, 
Brother John, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm really looking forward to it. God bless you. Thank you for all your dedication. And uh, you go ahead and get on up here and get going whenever you're ready then. You know what? Uh, let me do this. Uh, my mistake before that, I do want to... Hello. Let's have someone say a word of prayer for us before we begin. Who uh, who would like to say a word of prayer? How about Brother Scott? You uh, you on for that, buddy? Sure. Let's say a prayer and then turn the mic off and we'll begin. Pray with me, please. A uh, great and holy God, we are so grateful for this time to come together to study thy word that the new friends and relationships we are developing. We're grateful for this congregation that is putting on this lectureship and, and all the people that have put uh, some effort into it. Whether it's large or small, we are grateful for everything and we pray that that will continue to bless uh, each one of us with an increase of faith and uh, strength to be able to stand against all resistance. Give success to the efforts uh, of the preaching of that truth and especially at this time as Brother John comes up and gives us another lesson that will bless him with uh, swift recall and, and uh, excellence of, of uh, concentration that uh, there should be no distractions and let each one of us uh, receive all the benefits designed within my word and let this lesson uh, forgive us as we fail in every possible way that we uh, continue to return to thee and do the best that we can in Christ Jesus Amen, Amen. There we go. Okay, now we're good. <clears throat> well, as I'm getting started here, this is a lot louder than I anticipated. So. <laughs> Is no, is no. that too loud or is that okay? okay. That, that helps me that helps me a lot. I appreciate that. Um, I I do want to kind of join my thoughts here with Brother Steve and, and give a little bit of background. I know I'm gonna eat up a little bit of my time, but this is really important to me. So I, I appreciate you indulging me with this. For me, this is the most unnatural thing that ever could have been. And let me explain that. Coming from my background, if you know what an ante is, you'll understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. The antes do not... Uh, well, let me, let me qualify this. Um, I always considered myself an anti-ante anyway, so... <laughs> um, so this, this actually kind of works. But, you know, we were never allowed to, uh, to read books by uh, Art Adams or uh, uh, Boy Wallace. I mean, Ogden, uh, Foy Wallace, those, those kinds of things were, were foreign to us. As a matter of fact, they were an app to us. They, they were it's something that was not allowed. So to hear about these guys and, and from the liberal side of things, and I'm not saying, uh, uh, bear with me, I'm not doing this, uh, saying this to, to mean anything derogatory, nature, <clears throat> but to, to associate now with those who our brethren would call liberal or mainstream or actually they wouldn't even uh, honestly they would not even acknowledge yeah, that right. um, half the people in this room would be Christians if not all of, all of us now uh, they, certainly they don't view me as even a Christian now I'm just uh, totally off the radar for them so that's why I say this. this this in one way is the most unnatural thing for me because of my background but it's the most natural thing for me now because I understand now Amen. what it means to be a true Christian and that's what this is all about. Matter of fact, I think that I have come to a, a decision that um, and I thought this would be the best place in the world to announce this to these brethren here. I am not a preterist. I want you to understand that. I, I'm dropping that name in favor of a better one. I think from now on I'm going to refer to myself as a 2,000 year temporally displaced first century Fisherman and cat and, and uh, day labor believing Christian. I think, but maybe for brevity, I might refer to myself as a preterist every once in a while. So, so I might get that out of the way. 
this is actually celebrating, uh, about this time of the year, is celebrating our one year anniversary at our congregation for, for us as a congregation coming to this first century truth. And just a matter of fact, 10 of our members are here uh, this, this week. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm blown away by the support that they have given me, but not me, the gospel and the truth. This, this, is, this is just amazing. They, it just blows me away. And I'm so thankful for them and the good people. And I, I, like I heard here, you cannot find any better anywhere in the world than what you have in this room here today. So, so uh, I thank you all very much. What I want to do is talk about um, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5. It's actually what the uh, original intent was. So we're going to look here in Malachi at maybe a, a few things that might help us as we try to figure this out. This was one of the things that I learned early on. So maybe about a year ago, well, actually it would be less than that, um, I was seeing this, and then I came across Malachi 4 and verse 5, and I thought, whoa, wait a minute, this, this is really amazing. So here's what Malachi 4 verse 5 says, Behold, I'm going to send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Oh, wait, I forgot. Uh, I forgot my, uh, my charts and everything. Um, oh, that's right, they're in Indianapolis. I had painted them on some sheets and that kind of thing. <laughs> that tells you the only people laughing are the ones that are the oldest and <laughs> that know what seat painting is. So we're just going to use the Bible this morning. How's that? So Malachi 4 or 5 says, um, I'm going to send you light to the prophet before the coming of the great terrible day of the Lord. Wait a minute. Does this really say what it means and mean what it says? It has to. Right? The scriptures are, are pretty clear about this. So I started reading a little bit more and I look here in the third chapter. Verse 1, it says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So we read this passage too, and we see here that Malachi 3, Malachi 4, they're parallel. What they're saying is essentially the same thing. But there's a lot of things here that really just, just pop out at me. And the more I learn, the more I see, and the more I understand, the more I get it, and the more it just this one of those wow moments, you know, that, that uh, wow factor, as my good brother Jim Elliott likes to use that term. So here's what we're seeing. Now let's look at some of these things. So let's continue here in Malachi 3. Now notice here in the second verse, he says, but who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? This sounds like familiar language to me. For he is like a refiner's fire, up and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord in the days of old as in former years. Now, before I became a 2,000-year, temporally displaced, <laughs> first century Bible, you know, that kind of, kind, of, kind of Christian, I would have come to this passage, and generally all I ever got out of Malachi for my sermons was, will a man rob God? You know, that's, that's where we go. Uh -huh. and, uh, that's, and as soon as they uh, hear, well, we're going to talk about will a man rob God, the whole congregation goes, oh, you're going to talk about giving. You know, that, that kind of thing. There's so much more here. And really, Malachi is telling the children of Israel, listen, this is time for you to get things squared away. You're going to have to get straightened up. That's the message. It's just a whole lot more than, than the divorce passages that we go to or, or the money, you know, will a man rob God and that kind of thing. Malachi is saying, listen, this is it. Judgment is coming. That's some serious language. And he says judgment is coming. He says you're going to be re refined by fire, by fuller soap. He says you're going to be purified. You're going to have these things take place. Then he says, when that happens, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord. The days of old is in the former years. In other words, there was a time when Israel was, they were okay. They said, not anymore. And if you recall the, the earlier part of the book, he simply let them have it. He said, I'm sick and tired of you fill in the blank. Notice in verse 5, though, he says, then I will draw near to you for judgment. And there it is. He says, I'm going to draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the idol idolaters, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the wage earner and his wages, and the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the fallen and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. 
Now, this is very similar. Notice what John said. I think John may have borrowed, well, John through Jesus and the Holy Spirit and so forth. In Revelation 22, notice the language here. Verse 15 is, is where we're looking at. Notice what he says outside are the dogs and the sorcerers, the immoral persons, the murderers and the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices life. So we see here this Old Testament passage, this Old Covenant passage. Malachi is saying, listen, you're going to be judged. We see that taking place in the New Testament. That's, that's just, a, just a simple illustration, I think. But by the time we get over here to verse four, or chapter 4, verse 1, notice what he says. Behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the, and, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will, will be chapped. And the day is coming that will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. By the way, is anyone, anyone in here noticed that, if you read through the Old Testament, you see this phrase all the time, that day, in that day. Boy, it's everywhere, isn't it? So doesn't it behoove us as Christians to figure out what on earth that means? We're going to be looking at that here, of course. But he's talking about this day is coming, and he is, this is the second time. And he calls it judgment. Now notice what he says in verse 4. He says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even statutes and the ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb and all Israel. What is the law of Moses? He says, Go back and remember what's been taught here, because this step applies to you. Matter of fact, there's a passage that, that I've come to rely on. This is in John chapter 5, about verse 44. Sorry. Notice what Jesus says in John 5, verse 44. He says, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accused you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you would have believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. You know, I was always taught, oh, we don't need the Old Testament. Colossians 2.14 says it was, how did, the, how did Gary do that? I, I don't know if I can make this sound. <laughs> he did last night. It was nailed to the cross. And of course, they take, and I did this, I, I'm guilty of this, and I, I, I hate to even admit this. But I did the same thing. I was just following suit. Because this is what they told me to teach, this is what I taught. So the old law was nailed to the cross, and I'm not supposed to supposed to go back and read that Old Testament and actually understand what it means. But Jesus said, you can't understand me if you don't understand Moses. Amen. Sorry. So that's what we're doing. We're going to come back here and we're looking at these things. So when Malachi said, remember the law of Moses, my servant, he was saying, You're, this, is kind, this is very similar to what Peter did in the first two verses of 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Remember what he said? Go back and read the law and the prophets. Go back and look, listen to what the apostles said. If you want to understand this, we'll bring this up in further detail too as we go on. But verse 5 says, Behold, I'm going to send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So who is Elijah the prophet? Now there's some things that I like about Elijah. And I remember those stories. And it doesn't matter if you are a, how'd that go, temporally displaced. <laughs> if you're a first century Christian, if you believe the truth, or understood it the way that we did, this, those stories still apply, right? But now we understand them in technicolor rather than in black and white. Wait, I just told my age. <laughs> Anybody in here under the age of 40 understand what technicolor is? <laughs> One guy. <laughs> okay, how about now we understand it in HD or, or whatever. There you go. Okay, so now it's HD. Okay, so who is Elijah? Elijah's this guy. I love his attitude. Remember what he did? Is this, what is this? First uh, Kings 16 or 18, something like this. And he, he is making fun of the prophets of Baal. I love this. He says, well, well, maybe you need to go and wake up your God. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's went on a vacation. You know, whatever. I just love how he did that. And then on top of it, to add insult to injury, what's he do? He douses his offering with water, just totally floods it because he had faith in his God. So that's the kind of person that Elijah was. And that's why Elisha wanted a double portion, I guess you might say, before he left. Now, I'm not convinced, and, and uh, I'm not sure this would help our cause a whole lot either, but I'm not convinced that Elisha went to heaven in a whirlwind. 
I think that uh, he was just picked up and went somewhere else. We, I don't know how, how much time I want to take talking about this, but but uh, I, anyway, we see in, I think it's Second Chronicles 21, he writes a letter to, yeah, so anyway, we'll, we'll just, we'll leave that at, as I it is. I appreciate it, brother, you're doing good. Okay, well, let's go over here and look at it. Let's go over here and look at it. <laughs> oh, I'm, I want to do this. Yeah. Okay, look here at Second Chronicles 21. This is in verse 12. It says, Then a letter came to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord God of your father David, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat, your father. Matter of fact, he killed his family so that they couldn't take the throne. Um, this is uh, Jehoram, actually, who's writing the letter to him. Now, if you look at this and you go through here, you see that Elijah tells him, you're going to die. Your bowels are essentially going to come out. And that happened two years later. So we know that he died during the, the time that Jehoram was king. Now, when did he, when did he when was he taken up? Oh, this is Second Kings chapter two, I think. So we look here in Second Kings two, and we get this this uh, this idea of what was going on, and he it says that he was taken up. So notice here in verse uh, fifteen, when um, the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho opposite him, uh, they said, "The spirit of Elijah rests on Elijah." And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they said to him, Behold, now they are with you. Oh, actually, I'm, I'm a little further. I want to make this point later. Let's go back up. Verse 11. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire which separated the two of them. And Elijah went by a whirlwind to heaven. Now, if you look at this word heaven, I don't have a, a way to pull this up on, on my, uh, what do you call this, glassy thing here. <laughs> uh, iPad, there you go. Um, but I, know, I know, I am getting old, 49 and, and uh, going on 70. Okay, so um, Elijah went up in this world, went to heaven, and heaven here, I believe, is the Hebrew word for this air. It's not heaven where God is up. So we know that that's the case. So it, we can't prove this. Matter of fact, this is what I was reading here just a moment ago. These 50 guys said, well, hey, why don't we go look for him? And Elisha said, well, you're not going to find him. Then they kept bugging him and bugging him. So they, he said, well, go ahead. And they looked, what, for three days or so and didn't find him. And then they came back. He said, I told you so. <laughs> but then we see Elisha, or Elijah, rather, appearing there in Second Chronicles 21, still during this, the, apparently in the latter two years of the reign of Jehoram. So that's why I would say that. Maybe we could elaborate on that more if we really need it. But, so let's go back to this idea of Elijah. So he says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet here in Malachi 4 and verse 5, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now I was studying with a man from Mr. Walker, a, a preacher. He's an anti-preacher. And he is not an anti-anti-preacher. He is an anti-preacher. So, so uh, uh, but he's a good guy. And actually, believe it or not, there were some things that he actually agreed with me on. So maybe he was somewhat of an anti-anti, but... Uh, but didn't really realize that. Maybe he did. But a good man doesn't live too far from Holger. Maybe we can, uh, you know, do something like that. Yeah. Okay, so he's, I asked him at our last meeting, I said, just tell me, what does this mean? That Elijah's going to come, Elijah rather, is going to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. He's, and he said, well, there's lots of places in the Bible that talks about the day of the Lord. And I said, yes, of course. But what is the great and terrible day of the Lord? And who is Elijah? And what does this actually mean? Do you realize that there are Jewish satyrs that actually set a place today at their table for Elijah to come and sit with them? Because they believe that he will physically come back. And I actually think that there were people in the first century that believed the exact same thing, that Elijah was physically going to come back. Well, they were mistaken about that, obviously. We're going to see this in just a minute, too. So we're asking this question, who's Elijah and what is this great and terrible day of the Lord and how does this apply to them and to us today? Obviously, for us today, there's no application other than knowledge about the past and things that have been fulfilled. That's what being a temporally displaced person <laughs> or a preterist or seeing things in the past view is all about. So this idea that Elijah is going to come is ludicrous from the standpoint of those who believe that it's actually going to happen in the first century, or I'm sorry, in, in the, our future. If it didn't happen in the first century, physically, then it's never going to happen. We'll see why as we go through as well. 
Okay, so Elijah, we discovered who he is, what kind of person he was, and we know that. Probably lots of other passages we could have talked about. Now, who is Elijah? Well, let's look at some things. Let's turn over here to our New Testament, just a few pages away. Let's hear, look here in, let's go to Luke. Let's see the beginning of all this stuff. This is Luke, the first chapter, by the way. So we know that, that Zacharias was visited by an angel. Breaking, if I understand this correctly, about us. So here he is at the, at the altar. He's, he's doing, his, uh, uh, doing his thing. And all of a sudden, the angel comes to him and speaks to him. Then he, this angel says to him, for he will be, this is verse 15, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. The Luke 1, 15, if I didn't say that. To drink no wine or liquor, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. He will turn many of, uh, of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. This is exactly what was prophesied there in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 6. He says in verse 17, It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers, and here's the quote, back to the children, and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So this is how John came into the world. So John the Baptist was told, rather, John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was told he's going to be this man, this fulfillment of this prophecy, prophecy from Isaiah 40, verse 3. So he says that this is what's, how it's going to take place. All right. So now we're getting somewhere. So Malachi teaches that Elijah is going to come before the great terrible day of the Lord. So what we actually read here is exactly what it meant. So before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, then Elijah must come. Matter of fact, I have a quote here. If I find this, James Burton Kaufman. Anyone ever hear of this guy? Yeah. Okay, I figured you did. Now, here's what he says, and I, I, I didn't take the whole thing from his commentary, but, but just this one part. He was talking here about Malachi 3, 1, and 4, 5, about these, these two instances. And he says both, in referring to those, both will appear in order to make preparation for the coming of the Lord to judge his people. Now, after he went through his entire speech there in his commentary about this, he comes to the conclusion that Elijah must come before the Lord can judge his people at the coming of the Lord to judge his people. Now, was he actually saying, did he actually go to that degree? It sure sounds like it, that Elijah's going to have to come. Well, if that's the case, then maybe Elijah's going to bring a couple buddies with him. Maybe he'll bring the Antichrist and the man of perdition with him <laughs> somewhere in the future. I want to know if that's not the case. Have you ever noticed this, by the way? This might be a little bit of a sidebar. But one of the things that, that I always taught, I don't teach this anymore, by the way, just, just let you know. But one of the things I always taught is the Lord's going to come back in the future, and it's going to be, bam, like that. No signs. Everything's just, just going to be going on like it was. You'll get up in the morning, you'll go out, and you'll take a oh, big stretch and a big breath, and you smell the bacon cooking from the neighbor's house and all sorts of stuff. And all of a sudden, bam, people are going to be popping up out of the graves and all that kind of stuff. And yet we come across something like this. And this man says, Elijah's going to have to come. Then our, some of our other brethren are going home. Well, maybe the man of prediction, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's going to have to come too. And he'll have to appear. And then, then Christ, or maybe the Antichrist is different. I didn't really know. I'm going to start when I ever really knew, to be honest with you. Until <laughs> now. Elijah has already come. That's exactly what Jesus said. Elijah has already come. He said, if you can accept it, Elijah has already come. Now, think about it. Matter of fact, let's go over here and look at this. This is in Matthew 11. So here in Matthew 11, this is about verse 13. He says, all along the prophets uh, prophesied up until John. In verse 14, if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah, who was to come. But wait a minute. How can John be Elijah? And why on earth would he even say this? Well, here's the reason this even comes up. It's not that Jesus just out of the blue said, oh, well, uh, John's Elijah, by the way. There was a reason for this, because John sent his, some of his uh, disciples asking some questions. Notice here at the beginning of the chapter. 
It says here, verse 2, When John, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Now, I actually read an article from... Oh, I'm terrible with names. I can't remember my own kids' names. So, I, I read an article. How's that? This guy was, was saying that Jesus was Elijah. Uh, that can't be. Notice what is said here. He says... John says, are you the expected one? Well, John said that, no, I'm not, I'm not the one. We'll see this here in just a second. We'll go, we'll go to that passage. But he said, are you the expected one? Or shall we look for someone else? And Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. So they went back and they... Of course, they told him all these things. Verse 7 says, As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out to in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who, who wear soft clothing are, are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, one who is more than a prophet. So even Jesus was saying, Here's the guy who fulfills the prophecy. He was a prophet, of course. But he fulfills this. This is the one about whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. So Jesus says that John was Elijah. Now was John Elijah? Now it would be very easy if, if we were to go down that route that says, well, he was taken up to heaven and he didn't really die so that means he could actually still be alive and that's how he could come back. As, as... No. That confuses even me. <laughs> so... Jesus plainly said that John was Elijah, if you can accept it. Now, why would he say that, if you could accept it? I've thought about this. Well, that's the reason why. Because there were so many people who had all of these preconceived notions about who Elijah would be and, and what this was going to be and how this was going to be, be a great day when Elijah came back and this, this big pomp and this circumstance. And it wasn't that way. It was this guy wearing camel's hair... <laughs> And eating the diet that he did, bugs, right? Okay, now, well, let me think about this. Let's just think about this. The last time you saw a guy wearing camel's hair and eating bugs, what did you think of him? He, he's probably flying a sign, wasn't he? <laughs> we'll work for food kind of thing. Not that I'm disparaging anyone in, the, in need, but... So we, we would look at someone like that, and it certainly wouldn't be what we would think as, as the herald of Elijah. It wouldn't be that. But you know, that's exactly what happened with Jesus. Everyone expected this messianic figure to come in power and great glory, which he did. They just didn't understand. They didn't perceive it. Isaiah 26, right? They didn't perceive it. But they expected that. This is what the nation of Israel wanted. They wanted all these grandiose things, these great, big, wonderful things, but they never materialized. Not the way that they wanted them to. They materialized in a better way. And that's what's happening, going on. Jesus said, if you can accept it, John is himself Elijah. Now, that's significant. Even the apostles understood this. Let's turn over here to the Transfiguration. We're, we're still in Matthew, the 17th chapter. Here's another reason I say that, that Jesus was not Elijah. We're going to look at this. So remember the transfiguration. We'll not take the time to go through all of this. But So the transfiguration happens. They fall down on their faces. Jesus says to them, get up and do not be afraid. Verse 7. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. So Elijah and Moses had disappeared. And remember the story. In verse 9 says, they were coming down from the mountain. Jesus commanded them, saying, tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Well, that alone had to be enough to just... Uh, Surprise them, I guess. Make them really think about something. And the disciples said to him, Why then did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? So, were they thinking here, Well, we've seen Elijah, he's come. I think Jesus dispels that myth when he says to them, or that misconception, however you want to put it, he says to them, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. So he kind of, he's quoting here. He's doing the same thing we would do. Have you ever thought, by the way, that God speaks to man 
as man speaks to man. Have you ever thought about that? He's not trying to be overly complicated. He's not using these great big huge flowery words. Twenty dollar words, one brother used to say. He's just talking so that they could understand what he had to say. He said, Elijah's time he restore all things, which was the prophecy about it. We've just read that from Malachi. But I say to you, well this is very reminiscent of Matthew 5, isn't it? But I say to you, but I say to you, in other words, here's the truth about it. That Elijah already came. So here's the truth about it. Elijah's already came. It's not me. It was John. You can accept it. It was John. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. So here you have two distinct figures. This can't be Jesus that's going to be Elijah. Two distinct figures. He's already came. He's already suffered. And the Son of Man is going to suffer just like now, why is it that people don't get it? You ever wonder that? Well, I do. And Steve showed me a passage. This is in Isaiah 26. I refer to this a lot. This is good. Isaiah 26, verse 10 says, Though the wicked has shown favor, he does not learn righteousness. He deals unjustly in the land of uprightness and does not perceive the majesty of the Lord. There are people who just simply do not want to get it. Amen. They don't want to get it, Amen. so they don't get it. Look at verse 11. Oh Lord, your hand is lifted up, yet they do not see it. So, think about it like this. So here you have these armies surrounding Jerusalem. And they're building up their fortifications. They've got all of their machines, and they're getting ready to do some serious... they got people inside the city that are going, what's going on? I don't get it. <laughs> But then you had some that left that got it. Why did they get it? Because those who have insight, Daniel chapter 12, was about verse 4 or so, will shine brightly. It's the expanse of the heavens. I guess what is it. There are some people that get it because they have this good this is about. John, if you can accept it, was Elijah. Okay. This brings us up to John said of himself, we need to, to discuss this. John, let's look here in John 1. John himself said, no, I'm not Elijah. Why would he say, no, I'm not Elijah? We might be backpacking just a, a tad bit, but I think we need to. This is John chapter 1, verse 19. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So he says, I'm not Jesus. I'm, I'm not the Messiah. I think a lot of our brethren, those that we love, think that Jesus had three names. First name, middle name, and last name. Jesus the Christ. <laughs> but he was the Messiah. So John says, no, I'm not him. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. I can just see him doing this. Questioning him. And he says, I'm not the Messiah. And they say, well, are you a prophet? What are you? And he, sa he just says, are you Elijah? And he, and he just says, no. Maybe that's how it went. I, I don't know. But it would get a little frustrating dealing with these guys all the time, wouldn't it? So here's what he says. Of course, none of us in here have ever had to deal with anybody like this, right? No, right? Especially coming to this 2,000-year-old temple. <laughs> anyway. Verse 22, Then he said to them, Who are you? Or they said to him, Who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? So here's what John says about himself. So he knew what his mission was. I am a voice of, and he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3. I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. So John knew about what he was. But he wasn't going to play their games. He wasn't going to get trapped by their words. He just answered them. Answered them. He knew that he was not physically Elijah. He was John, the son of Zacharias. That's who he was, and he knew that physically. But he knew that he was in the spirit as we read there, as was told to his, his, his dad. He was in the spirit of Elijah. Okay, now, this 
really gives us a lot to think about. Because if what we're saying here is true, then there's some conclusions that we're going to have to come to. We're going to have to accept these things. And I know that the people in this room are already convinced about what I'm talking about. And hopefully, maybe, uh, we're making videos? Yes, sir. Okay. Hopefully, maybe somebody will hear this story. Not necessarily for me, but, but, but this story resonates. And it's undeniable. This is, this is like looking at Matthew 16, 27, and 28 and trying to say, this is Pentecost. This is undeniable. It's not Pentecost there, and neither is this some uh, just story. There was something here. And even Jesus said John was Elijah. And if, if Malachi 4 and verse 5, what did it say? Behold, I'm going to send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Then that means something. Because you know that the Lord God reveals His secrets to His servants, the prophets. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. And why does He do that? So that we can know. He's not hiding anything from us. Matter of fact, what he did was he laid it out, his eternal purpose, right? He laid it out from Genesis to Revelation. I, I agree with that 100%. I don't remember who said that yesterday. Maybe it, was, uh, maybe it was Gary. Did you say that? He laid it out from beginning to end for us. So what, is, what, is, what are the implications here? Is, you know, Malachi might have been a minor prophet, but he had a major message. And he was laying it out, and he was saying exactly what was going to happen. This was given to us so that we might know about these things. So Elijah was to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. What is the great and terrible day of the Lord? Well, let's discuss this. Especially for those who have never considered the great and terrible day of the Lord. Let's look at Isaiah 13 for just a moment. I have a few verses to point out here. Verse 6. Listen to this, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6. This is, of course, concerning uh, Babylon. Wail for the day. Okay, so we see the day of the Lord. But he says, wail. The day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. So we see the day of the Lord. Then we see this great day of the Lord. Then we see something that's kind of terrible. Destruction from the Almighty. Anyone's going to consider destruction from the Almighty is terrible, right? This great and terrible day of the Lord. This gets better. Therefore all the hands will fall limp and every man's heart will melt. That's pretty terrible, isn't it? <laughs> Verse 9, The day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger. He will exterminate its sinners from it. Verse 11, Then I will punish the world for its evil. Verse 12, I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold. Verse 13, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of His burning anger. That sounds pretty terrible, doesn't it? Now, a lot of our friends would say, well, this is talking about the end of time. By the way, I'm willing to put some skin in the game. I'll give you whatever i got in my pocket. See, I already know what i got in my pocket, so I can do that. If you, if you can come up with any place in the Bible, in the Scriptures, in the Word of God, that talks about the end of the world. I know that's a safe bet. Now, if you're reading some, some translations where they have put the word world in for aeon or eon, however you want to pronounce that, then you might have something, but until you look at the original word, then, then your argument's gone. That's right. So he says, these are some pretty terrible things. Well, you know, there's a, a. This isn't the only place. But I want to look at a few other things. Um, let's look at. He's at uh, let's look at Ezekiel, chapter thirty. So here in Ezekiel thirty, notice what he says. Well, this is in the in the second verse. Son of man, prophesying, say, thus says the Lord God. Well, alas for the day. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, and it will be a day of clouds and a time of doom for the nations. This sounds pretty terrible, doesn't it? I'm actually going someplace with this. How about Zephaniah? Let's look at Zephaniah chapter 1. I think it's just fun to say Zephaniah. Let's look at it. Okay, notice here what he says in Zephaniah. There's a few things to look at here. In the first chapter, verse 7, he says, Be silent before the Lord God 
But the day of the Lord is near. For the Lord has, has prepared a sacrifice. Okay. Besides, the day of the Lord is near. Verse 14. Near is the great day of the Lord. Near and coming very quickly. Listen for the day of the Lord. Verse 18 says, On the day of the Lord's wrath, and all of the earth will be devoured in the fire of His jealousy, for He will make a complete end. Wow. This is amazing. That sounds pretty terrible, doesn't it? The second chapter, verse 2, He says, Before the decree takes effect, the day passes like the chaff. Before the burning anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. This is getting pretty serious. This is terrible stuff. The day of the Lord here, great and terrible. And of course, we can't leave out Joel. I need to, uh, we, we've got to look at Joel. Joel, the second chapter, because Peter actually quotes Joel. Peter, in, on the day of Pentecost, you know what he's talking about? The great and terrible day of the Lord. It's something I never preached until I learned the truth. Peter was telling him, listen, you might think this is something, but wait till you see what's coming. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's Joel chapter 2. First verse, he says, Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. Now notice here he says, There has never been anything like it, in verse 2 at the end. Nor will there be any again after it. Well, that sounds awful familiar now, doesn't it? Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. Oh, but all of that is just talking about the, the destruction of Jerusalem. And then there's a transition verse. But there's, if, if you go by the word but, you ever talk about this in the Olivet Discourse? How many transitions would there be in, in the Olivet Discourse? Just saying. Okay, so anyway, so he's talking about this. He says there's never going to be anything like it again. He says the day of the Lord, verse 11, last part, the day of the Lord indeed is great and very awesome. Who can endure? That's pretty serious. The day of the Lord is great and very awesome. I wonder why Peter was preaching that on the day of Pentecost. Notice what he says here in verse uh, 30. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So what is this great and terrible day of the Lord that is to be coming? When what Malachi said takes place, when Elijah comes, when what Jesus said takes place, he said it already taken place. Now, we're going to have to choose one of two things. This was getting ready to happen in their generation, exactly like Jesus said it would, or we're going to have to have some kind of uh, adaptive gap theory. And let's think about this. 2,000 years... I think Gary used this word again, that, that, that there were some elastic words going on there. That's not elastic. That is, and I'm going to tell you, you're going to, tell, you're going to hear my age. That is not elastic. That's super elastic bubble plastic is what that is. I don't know if anyone even remembers that. This little piece of something you put on a straw and you blow it and it gets super huge. You get four or five foot balloon out of that thing. And that's what they're doing. They're trying to just stretch this and stretch it and stretch it and stretch it. We figured out how far Stretch Armstrong could stretch when I was a kid before he broke. <laughs> and you would figure that at some point it's going to break and they're going to see it. But guess what? Isaiah 26. They're not going to see it because they don't want to see it. Amen. And that's, that's sad. You know, I have to say this. I love my brethren. There's this guy in Indianapolis who for the life of him, his name's John Noe. He cannot understand this exclusivity going on with the Church of Christ. You know what it is? It's called brotherhood. It's called having unfeigned love for the term. And I hate to see my brethren. Drew Leonard. He's our brother. And he's wrong. Amen. And we love him, and, and we're not going to get up here and tell him he's going to hell and, and there's nothing you can do and, and it's good for you to burn. But you know, have you ever noticed that they, they're willing to turn that around on us? Yeah. Who's got the right heart in the matter? We all know, we all know the answer to that. Amen. Because that is true first century Christianity. Amen. It's not preterism. It's Christianity. That's the way you're supposed to be. That's what the Scriptures teach. And when they look at 
get these passages and they can't understand what the great and the terrible day of the Lord is, then how do we get them to see that? Patience, long suffering. You know, sometimes you're going to sit and you're going to argue and argue and argue. Maybe they'll get it. Maybe they won't. One thing's for sure, you'll come out better on the other end of it. You'll be smarter. You'll have more patience. And you'll be able to help the next guy better, maybe. But the great terrible day, Lord, why can't they see it? Why don't they get this? The truth is they just don't want to. A lot of guys are so wrapped up in their career. Amen. Preach it, brother. Preach it now. I'm getting ready to talk about a little bit of something here. What would a man give? Somebody answer this for me. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? Mm. But think about that. What is so valuable in this life? Your books that you're selling? Is, is that? Okay. <laughs> um, the nice, cushy, Six-figure, low, six-figure, maybe salary that you got with benefits and everything else is that is that more important than your soul? Maybe you have TV shows, gospel meetings, and notoriety. That's more. Important. <laughs> That's exactly right, brother Holger knows it. You know, these bunch of uh, dirt poor fishermen walking around with one change of clothes. Well, wouldn't that have been a group to be walking around with in, in the summertime? Now think about that. This Messiah figure who looked like everybody else. Christianity is not about the show. It's about where we're going to go. And that's what matters. Now let's think about these implications. Oh, I want to, I want to say something while I was on. That GBN interview, I had never heard of this. I truthfully had never heard of GBN until... I think maybe Scott sent a link or somebody did about this interview. Maybe it was Daniel. I don't, I don't remember. So I watched this and I'm like, wait a minute. This can't be right. Are these guys really saying this? And you know what they said? They actually said that you and I are in this so that we can have power over other people. <laughs> okay. Power. Yeah. So how many preachers in here lost their salary? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, how many of us had to take a real hard, long look at where our life was going to be headed and know that when you came out and you said, I believe the truth, that it was going to cost you your job? How many brethren, you don't have to be a preacher to experience this, have been totally rejected by their families and their friends and their brethren because they stood up for the truth? Now do you know what it means to be a Christian? Amen. That's what it is. That's living life as a child of God. You're going to be rejected. And that's why they reject this. Because they don't want to give that up. You know, there are people that I love, and even on Facebook, every once in a while on Facebook, people will say a few negative things to me. And, <laughs> and a lot of them are people that I have known all my life. I've sat beside them in the pews. Watch babysat their kids, you know, that kind of stuff. Being a Christian is not easy. But let me put it this way. It's worth it. If you miss heaven, my friends, you have missed it all. Period. And this is what being a child of God is about. Let's get back to these implications of God. What this means. I know I'm running out of time. He said, remember what Moses taught. Remember there, Malachi 4 and verse 4. Remember what Moses taught. Okay, Moses taught about these things. We went through what the great and terrible day of the Lord is. So, didn't that sound like a lot of language that we read in the first century, or I'm sorry, in the New Testament? Written in the first century? I'm talking clouds of smoke and fire and brimstone and, uh, I don't know, it just went blank on all the, all the, all the other words. So there's so many. And we would go through the, the, all of that discourse and we see Jesus used that language, didn't He? We see it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and there in the, uh, chapter 5. We see it in 2 Peter 3. And we also see it in John's... Uh, you remember in, in the book of John where John was writing about the all of that discourse? Oh, well, wait a minute. He wrote the long version in <laughs> Revelation. 
But that was his all that discourse. And it's the same language. Okay, so let's ask ourselves this question. If that's the language that the prophets used, Peter even said it. We quoted that from 2 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2. If that's the language that Jesus said, you're going to have to understand or you can't understand me, then when He uses this language, and they use that language, why would it be something other than the way that they used it? In other words, they used it as this judgment on national Israel, on Judaism, the, the old covenant, however you want to put this, and it was going to come to an end. And it would be great and terrible. So why? Why would it be something different? All of a sudden, after how many, 1,500 years? And the language changes? It doesn't make sense. So we have to look at those things and we have to say to ourselves, when Jesus said, what did he say? Let's look at Matthew chapter 16. Of course, there's, there's not a temporally displaced first century Christian in this room that can quote this verse, right? But in verse 27, Matthew 16, for the Son of Man is about to... Well, wait, am I, am I allowed to use mellow here? Okay. <laughs> Is about to, my version says going to, but it's about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now we have to point a thing or two out here. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but maybe someone else will hear this. The Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father. What was the glory of his Father? How did he come in all those ways that we just described? Isaiah 19, is it verse 1? It says he's riding on a cloud. That's exactly the way Jesus said, you're going to see me coming on the clouds with power and great glory. Nothing different. And what was that? Now, I have a difficult time. My brain just works this way. When I were to look at Isaiah 19, and I see these words, it paints a picture in my mind of Yahweh riding on a cloud that's shaped like a Harley. I don't know why. I don't know, I don't know why that popped in my head. But So he's riding on a cloud. Now did he literally, physically, visibly come on a cloud? No, he didn't. But how did the Lord use, or how did he destroy Babylon? How did he destroy Egypt? How did he do it? Did he do it physically or did he use other people? This is the exact same thing that happened in the first century at 70. He used the Romans just like he had done time and time again with other nations. No different. It's the same language. We're not expected to come up with a new interpretation for something that is old language. That's right. Think about it. Revelation chapter 6. Let's look at this. Revelation chapter 6. Notice what this says. He says that this is getting ready to happen. Actually, it's already happened. Look at this. Revelation 6. Verse 15. Sorry. But he says, The kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free hid themselves. And uh, in the caves and among the rocks and the mountains... And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. There's that language again that we've been reading. For the great day of the able to stand. That's Malachi. Some of the same language. He says this day has come. Now how many passages do we need to go through to understand that judgment is coming because Malachi said, prophesied, and Jesus affirmed that Elijah had come. Let's look at Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Now, there's a couple things in here that I find remarkable. I know all the veterans in here probably went through this, and I'm just probably saying things that uh, you've already got down pat, but, but this is helping me tremendously, so I appreciate your patience. Isaiah 40 and verse 3 says, this is about John. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a, a highway for our God. Okay, so I've quoted that many times, uh, many years. I started preaching in 1995. I was 27 years old, full time. Before that, I was gone. I was gone so much preaching 
have local area congregations filling in there in central Indiana that uh, I actually came to services one day uh, ironically at the church I'm preaching at now and uh, we came in and one of the guys thought it would be funny to bring a, a visitor's card up to us and say hey would you fill this out and we're here <laughs> so, so uh, I've used this verse many times but now I understand it so we understand that this was referring to John but notice here what he says as we keep going through this. This was not only prophesied about John the Baptist, but this is about judgment. Look at verse 10. Behold, the Lord will come with His might, with His arm for ruling Him. Behold, His reward is with Him, and His recompense before Him. This is about judgment. So when John comes, judgment is on His heels. Get it? And that's something else. I saw that, and I thought, no way. Then I said to myself, yes way. <laughs> it is that way. That's how this is. Now think about this. We can read through other passages that judgment was to come when the kingdom came. That's exactly what he was talking about. What was John preaching? You ever think about that? Repent for what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So judgment comes when the kingdom comes. So let's turn over here and look at, look real quick and I'll, I'll wrap this up. Let's, let's look at, um, yeah, let's, let's just do this one. So, this is what I was saying. Luke chapter 21, verse 20. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. In other words, anyone in here ever hear of a guy named Jeff Foxworthy? Years ago, he said, Here's your sign. But guess what? Here's your sign. This is the sign. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize her desolation is near. He says, uh, we we'll just skip down a little bit, those who are in the country must flee, uh, must not enter the city because these are the days of vengeance. I know, hold this is your passage. I'm sorry to steal your thunder here. <laughs> these are the days of vengeance so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. He says, when you see this happening, guess what? This is it. This is the judgment. So it's all been set up perfect. The prophecy. Elijah came. Jesus verified it. Jesus said these things are going to happen in this generation. Do you see how the Old Testament, that Old Covenant, how God was looking out for us and He was saying, here's the road map, just follow it. You ever notice that? About the last, what, three or four chapters of Daniel? It's a road map through time. And it is accurate. Matter of fact, matter of fact, uh, I'm gonna have to start using that. Stop using that roadmap idea because I think Holder might be the only one that uses the roadmap anymore. It's a GPS through time, and it's accurate. You're not. I gotta admit, I miss the days when I could look ahead on the map and see, hey, there's a road up here. That's right. Yeah. Rather than. Wait till you drive off the cliff and say, oh, the GPS was wrong. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So here's the sign. This is happening. It's taking place exactly the way the Lord said. And notice what He says. He says about these things. Verse 31. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize the kingdom of God is near. And truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, unless what I see is obvious or obvious truth here, then maybe I should get into the candle business. Because there's got to be a lot of people still alive that are going to need a couple thousand candles once a year for their birthday cake. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So what we see here is the prophecy. We see the words that fill it all in. We see it verified. We see it take place through the Scriptures alone. You know, we can look at some historical things that, that verify the Scriptures, but what's better than the Scriptures themselves? This is it, my friends. Word of Jesus. Plain and simple. Thank you for the way that you listened, and uh, it's about as good as I can do. I feel like I should offer an invitation, you know? <laughs> Okay. Oh, that's that's it. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Brother John. Excellent, excellent, excellent lesson. And uh, I agree with you, by the way, on Elijah. I, I think that Acts 8 works well with that, how Philip was caught away, yes. and then he found him somewhere else. Yep. I think that's perhaps what happened with Elijah as well. But uh, good lesson. Thank Appreciate you. it. Excellent, excellent. All right, let's by just the way, when, the young, when those young men said, go up, go up to Elijah, yeah. all they were saying, get out of here like he went. That's what they're saying. Same thing. There you go. Yeah. So let's uh, let's take five, and uh, we'll take a breath. Let's only take five, though. At a quarter after, uh, Sharp, uh, we'll come back, then Brother Brent Bishop will uh, give his lesson. Thanks again, John. Beautiful. Uh,
Okay, it's a uh, it's quarter after. Let's be finding our seats, please. I, I know. I know. I know we're all having a good time. We're all visiting, and, and fellowship is beautiful. And uh, I'm so glad we have this opportunity to do it. But at the same time, we do have to keep some uh, respect for the time constraints. So uh, let's be finding our seats, please. Morning, Sean. How you doing, brother? Good. Let's go. It's time. I'm going to pull a KJV here. Let me tell you that the Lord is at hand. The time has come to sit down. <laughs> okay, the next speaker of the hour is Brother Brent, Brent Bishop from California, Springfield, right? Springville. I don't know why I have such a hard time remembering Springville, but uh, uh, Brother Brent Bischel and his lovely wife Sherry have flown in from California, and uh, a few, few more people getting their seats here. Uh, Brother Bischel called me, I don't know, um, what did you call me? I mean, <laughs> he called me about six months ago and uh, said he was really encouraged. He found me on YouTube. He'd been uh, searching for people who had believed similarly to him, and he was so excited that he found us up here in Michigan teaching and preaching, believing the same thing that he had found and discovered, separate apart from us, through his own studies, this truth that we've all come to realize. And he was so excited to see that there was out people actually out there on the internet publicly challenging others and going after it and wanting to wake the brotherhood up to these realities to these truths and we just like uh, uh he he said he called me one day after we got to know each other a little bit better he said i think you're my twin in michigan <laughs> <laughs> and that's you know, and it, how beautiful you know uh is it that we can find each other and be together and this thing's going to just really uh, solidify our relationships and our, our friendship and the truth of god's word is church and god's people Brent Bishop's a good man, and he, like John, is standing in the gap. One thing about Brent is uh, he takes it to him. I mean, uh, each of us have our own style. Um, I appreciate Brent's style in that he he doesn't give any slack, and he goes right at it, and he's not ashamed of it, and he's, he's just going to stand on what he believes. And I can't think of any greater character for any gospel preacher in my life to stand for what you believe and not be ashamed of it, not worry about losing your money, not losing your fame and prosperity you know, uh, among the brethren, but you're just going to stand for the truth regardless of consequence. That's God's people. I uh, love Brent. I love his uh, manner, and I cannot wait to hear him give his lesson um, this morning on the Song of Moses. So, Brother Brent Bischel, whenever you're ready, brother, come on up here and give your lesson, and uh, thank you so much for coming all the way and being here with us this morning. Can you hear me? 
Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm new to this. I've only seriously looked at this for about a year and four months now. Afraid when I first called him because he didn't know what I was going to call him or why I was calling him. But I was excited uh, to see him. Is this too loud? It seems loud to me. No? All right, we're going to look at Deuteronomy 32. And um, this is my understanding of it at this point. And so, being new to this, I would ask my elder brethren that if there is anything that I need to be corrected on, please feel free to address this after my lesson. And so I want to qualify that now as we learn together. We're all growing and we're all learning together. And we're working these things out. We're going to look at Deuteronomy 32 in the New Testament. In Genesis 49, verses 1 and 10. The Bible says this, And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together, underline that word gather, by the way, gather together, that I may tell you what may befall you in the last days. The scepter, and my understanding of that is the ruler's staff or rod, shall not depart from Judah, that is the tribe of Judah. Then he says, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, meaning from the lineage of the bloodline or the loins of Judah, until Shiloh come. Now, the, the word Shiloh is a Hebrew word that is translated or can be translated tranquil or peaceful one. And so this is a word in the, in the Hebraic language that refers to Jesus Christ. And it says, to him, that is Christ, or Shiloh, shall be the obedience, or gathering, and I would encourage you to underline that, the gathering, or the obedience of the people. Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel, as we all know, he knew that he was about to die. He knew that he was to be gathered to his people. And so at this point, he gives here some last words to his sons. And Jacob made some very important prophetical statements about things which would occur in the last days. And thus we have this great Shiloh prophecy uh, in, here in chapter 49. The thread of this term last days begins right here. This is the first mention, at least that I can find in the Bible about the last days. Jacob said that Shiloh would come in the last days. And it's my understanding, and I have um, looked at this, and I know there are some people who believe, believe another, but at this point, it is my understanding that Jacob here spoke about the first coming of Christ. And I will concede that there are others who believe this is talking about the second coming of Christ. But up, my understanding to this point is the first coming. But, Nonetheless, the first coming of Christ through his virgin birth as Christ came into the world to initiate the last days was prior to Pentecost. And thus the last days does not refer to the Christian age as some of our own brethren have taught us to believe. It's a term that we find that refers to the end of the Jewish age and the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Now the Bible student must understand that the quotation of Old Testament verses by the writers or the apostles of the New Institute, this is that which was spoken, as we find Peter saying of Joel's prophecy in Joel chapter, or in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 and following. Thus, when the apostles quote the Old Testament, they were making application and implying the, the fulfillment of of that quotation of the Old Testament prophecy in their day and time. And so we have to understand as students of the Bible that these things were being fulfilled in their day and time. There is, as we look at the, the totality of what the Bible teaches, there is no other Old Testament chapter that is quoted in the New Testament more than Deuteronomy 32. And so Deuteronomy 32 really sets the tone 
of the entire New Testament. And if you do not understand Deuteronomy 32, you will have a very difficult time putting the pieces together when it comes to reading the New Testament. So Deuteronomy 32 is prophetical of Israel's last days, the events from the time of Christ all the way through the tribulation period, starting at the establishment of the church on Pentecost, including the great tribulation period mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 24, from A.D. 66 through 70, including the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, thus fulfilling Daniel 9 and Daniel 12. Now, as we look at some of the quotations in Deuteronomy 32, I want us to look at Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4. This is quoted in Revelation, this is going to go quick, this is quoted in Revelation 15, 3 and 4. Deuteronomy 32 and 5 is quoted in Acts 2 and verse 40, and then again by Paul in Philippians 2 and verse 15. Deuteronomy 32 and 8 is quoted in Acts 17 and verse 26. Deuteronomy 32, 16 is quoted by uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 22. Deuteronomy 32 and 17 is quoted in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 20, and it's alluded to or echoed uh, in Revelation 9 and verse 20. Deuteronomy 32.21 is quoted by Paul in Romans 9, verses 6 through 9, also in Romans 10 and verse 19, and it's alluded to in Romans 11.11 11 and Ephesians 3 and verse 6. Deuteronomy 32, verses 22 through 27, is alluded to in Matthew chapter 22, the, the wedding uh, parable there, and Revelation 18, verses 8 through 10, Revelation 19, 7 through 9, and 2 Peter 3, verses 7 through 12. Deuteronomy 32, 35, and 36 is directly for whoever the Hebrew writer in Hebrews um, chapter 10, and verse 30. And it's alluded to throughout the book of Revelation many, many times, Revelation 6, 12 through 17, Revelation 11, 17 and 18, Revelation 14, Revelation 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. So this is very significant that we understand this song of Moses. Deuteronomy 32, 43 is quoted by Paul in Romans 15 and by John in Revelation 18 and 20 and 19 and verse 2. Now, in this lesson, I don't have 47 hours to go through the entire chapter. So what I'm going to do is just scratch the surface on, on what this chapter is about. And I do not claim to know all of the details or all of the nuances in this chapter, but I am a student of the Bible, and that's all I am. I am a student of Bible prophecy, and as a student of Bible prophecy, I, I do know enough about this chapter to understand that it's directly related to and directly connected with the New Covenant, with the New Testament, and the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel, and to Israel's eschatology in the last days, and the book of Revelation. That's right. Now I want you to notice Isaiah 43 and verse 1. There the prophet says, or God through the prophet says, But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, now this is referring to Israel. Jacob is just another synonym for the nation of Israel. And he says, and he who formed you, O Israel. So I want us to realize, folks, that the nation of Israel was created by God. Look at Ezekiel 36 and verse 11. There God says through Ezekiel, he says, I will multiply you, or upon you, man and beast and do better for you than at your beginnings. So here, Israel had a beginning, and Ezekiel refers to that beginning. God formed Israel. He created Israel as a people and as a nation to serve Him. And Israel would also have an end, and that end would last days, or in the last days, or as Deuteronomy 32 says, their end or their latter days. So these are the very days, the end days, the last days of Old Covenant Israel. And in these days, the New Testament writers wrote about 
in fulfillment of Deuteronomy 32. And so this end, or their latter end that is mentioned in Deuteronomy 32, 29, was the only end, folks, that Israel knew about. Now, our brethren talk about the end, end, and all kinds of different endings here and there, right? But here, this end is the only end that Israel knew about. They didn't know about an end, end. They only knew about one end, and it would come in their last days at the change of the covenants. Is right? Now, Moses wrote two songs. The first song of Moses is found in Exodus 15. Now, I'm going to skip over that because that is not the song of Moses that the New Covenant or the New Testament deals about. When Israel was delivered out of Egyptian bondage, Moses wrote his first song in Exodus 15. But he wrote a second song in Deuteronomy 32. And this song he taught to the nation. And so in Deuteronomy 31, in verse 22, Moses taught Israel the song. They had to learn the song because it dealt with their eschatological end. It dealt with them as, they would, as their nation and their covenant would come to a close or come to an end in the last days. This song, folks, was prophetic concerning the things that would occur to them as a nation in the last days, or in their end, or their latter days, there in Deuteronomy 31 and 29. Now, as we look at the, the latter days, there's so much false teaching about this that it's, it's almost like a smorgasbord that you can just pick and choose because there's so much teaching about what is the last days, are we in it now, or are they to come, or have they gone? But I want us to realize that all of the ministry of Christ occurred in the last days of Israel according to the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. When we look at Genesis 49, verses 1 and 10, this teaches us that Shiloh would come in the last days. So says Jacob. Now, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, these, these scriptures we're all familiar with. It says there that God, who at various times and in his various ways, spoke in times past unto the fathers, by or through the prophets, has in these, what does it say? Last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now, the last days here, this phrase... What does it refer to? You see. He has in the la these last days spoken unto us by His Son. The Son spoke unto us, literally spoke, during His ministry, right? Shake your head this way. He did. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, He literally spoke to them as He was teaching the nation of Israel about the coming kingdom. And so this is speaking about the ministry of Christ. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 speaks about the ministry of Christ being the last days. It's not the entire gospel dispensation. It started here at the time of Christ and it went unto the end. Now, the Hebrew writer, he is not referring here as we have been taught in preacher school or wherever you have been taught from in the churches of Christ. He's not speaking about the, the last days of the church age, the last days being the gospel dispensation and some end of days in our future. He's speaking here about the last days of the Mosaic age, the last days of Israel, and in direct connection to fleshly Israel's eschatological end. That was the last days. So says the author of the book of Hebrews. Now after... Uh, all of the writing of the New Testament was done and was completed in the last days of Israel. And that's why we find silence after A.D. 70. You don't find anything written after the last days. Look at Hebrews 9 and verse 26. 
There the writer says, but now, once at the end of the ages, now I want you to underline that in your Bible, ages, plural, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. When did Christ appear? Did he appear at the end of the church age? No, brother. He appeared in the, at, in, at the end of the ages, that is, at the end of the Jewish age, to put away sin. Amen. Right? So the last days is not the gospel dispensation. Here he says he has appeared once at the end of the ages. When did Christ appear? Well, he appeared at his baptism, right, from his cousin John. And he was here for three and a half years. And then the Jews crucified him and killed him and he went back into heaven. So here, he appeared at the, once at the end of the ages. He has appeared to put away sin. So this is not referring to the gospel dispensation. This is referring to the last ages or the last days of the Jewish dispensation. Now this is talking about his first appearance in the form of his virgin birth, right? We still believe in that. I hope that we do. But Christ appeared to put away sin at the end of the ages. Now, the, this is the end of the Old Covenant age. This fits perfectly with what Peter said in 1 Peter 1 and verse 20, where Peter says, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest. Notice that. Was manifest when? In these last times. So this is not referring to the gospel dispensation. It's not referring to our days today. This is referring to the, the last times where Christ was made manifest during the end of the Jewish age. Now someone, I know someone, not here maybe, but some of our brethren who will watch this later are going to object and argue that the text says ages, plural, and, and Peter says times, plural plural, and not age, singular, or time, singular. That's fine, because they can argue that all they want. This is a form of Hebraic idiom. It's a figure of speech called a heterosis. And this is an exchange in the form of words. It includes the exchange from a verb for another, of one form of mood for another, of one form of number for another. Thus, from age to ages, from time to times, and one form of gender for another, even at times in the Scriptures. So in dealing with the exchange of the plural for the singular, we're here, the Hebrew writer says in the, he has appeared in the, in the, at the end of the ages. Why did the Hebrew writer use the plural and not the singular? Why did Peter say that he was manifest in the last times, plural, and not the last time, singular, because these men were using this Hebraic idiom of a heterosis, in which you exchange the form of words in order for emphasis to be placed on that word. And so in dealing with the exchange of the plural for the singular, this is done when great excellence or magnitude is denoted or is needed to be emphasized. And so these men were not literally talking about the end of the ages. This is a heterosis. They pluralized this for emphasis. They were not talking about the, the last times. In other words, there wouldn't be many last times. They were referring to the last time, but they used a form of heterosis in order to exchange and pluralize it for emphasis. And thus, there's examples of this. I, I put one example here of Psalms. 51 verses 17 and 19. That is just one example. Thus the ages and the putting emphasis on the singular term or the singular word age and time. Now look at Galatians 4 and verse 4. Paul says, but when the fullness of the time, you see he didn't use the heterosis here, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent Here's the equivalent to Peter's manifested, right? God sent. This was talking about his virgin birth, his first coming. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So here again, 
we have the emphasis of the last days was the time that was under what? The law. That's the time that Jesus was manifested in his virgin birth. And so the time that Jesus was manifested was during the law of Moses, under the old covenant. That began the last, thus the fullness of the time, that is Christ being made manifest in these last times, as Peter said, and him appearing to put away sin at the end of the ages, according to Hebrew, the Hebrew writer, refers to the last days of Israel under that law of Moses, under the old covenant. And thus the New Testament was written in the last days of the old covenant age, meaning that new covenant eschatology is old covenant eschatology. There is no difference. Now, folks, there's nothing new about eschatology in the New Testament. I want you to notice the, par the parallels here. I almost said parables. Deuteronomy 32, look at verses 3 and 4. Now, I'm going to read this fast, but we're going to make a comparison. Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. It says, His work is perfect, for all His ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is He. Now notice the parallel in Revelation 15, 3 and 4. They sing the song of Moses, and it's a song of victory, by the way. The servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Listen, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. Now pay attention. He says, O King of the saints, who shall fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? Notice, for you alone are holy, and all the nations shall come and worship before you. This is the expansion of the gospel according to the promise of Genesis 12 and verse 3. For your judgments have been manifested. This is the judgment. We'll get into the judgment here. But this is the judgment of the New Testament, or that's mentioned in the New Testament, in the last days of Israel. Now notice Deuteronomy 32. I've, I've listed them there on the PowerPoint. I hope it's working just fine. Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4. Notice the parallel. Greatness to our God. Right? There it is. His work is perfect. Look at the parallel. Revelation 15. Great and marvelous. Do you see it? Great and marvelous are your works. Moses said his work is perfect. The song of Moses in Revelation 15 is parallel in every way. Great and marvelous are your works. Folks, do you see it? I want you to see the parallel here. Look at Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4. Moses says all his ways are justice. Look at the parallel in Revelation 15 and 3. Just and true are your ways. Folks, do you see it? It's there for you to see if we will open up our, our mind to the truth. Deuteronomy 32 and 4, Moses said, Righteous and upright is he. 15. For you alone are holy. That's parallel, folks. It's parallel. People that with our brotherhood today, they have eyes, but they do not see. Amen. They have a mind. See. And so some folks don't want to see it. Some folks don't want to hear it. They have ears, but they will not hear it, right? Same thing going on today that went on in Jesus' time. And so they, they have the perception, but it's not being used in order to see these things. Yes. So for some folks don't want to see and perceive and understand it. I want you to see this directly connects the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 to the book of Revelation. Now let Drew Leonard deal with that issue. But this proves that the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 is directly connected to Israel's eschatological end. And here it's quoted in Revelation 15. Deuteronomy 32 and 5. They have corrupted themselves, Moses said. This, this wasn't at that time. It would happen in the last days. In the last days, was Israel corrupt? Shake your head this way, because they were. Absolutely they were corrupt. And so here, Moses said they have corrupted themselves in the last days. 
But he said, are they not his children? Or they are not his children, rather, because of their blemish. Here is their corruption. They have become corrupt. They blemish themselves through disobedience. He said, line this in Deuteronomy 32 and 5, a perverse, listen here, and crooked generation. That's what Moses called them. We're going to run into that here in the New Testament. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. Peter, in the, the first time that the blood of Jesus was ever preached for the forgiveness of sins, he said in, with, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, save yourselves, the old King James says, be saved from this, what? Someone say. Yes, perverse. Do you see that? Deuteronomy 32 and 5. Be saved from this perverse or crooked generation. When Peter quotes here, he's quoting from Deuteronomy 32 in the first gospel sermon. The first time the gospel was ever preached, he is quoting from Deuteronomy 32 and 5. Now, it's not only Peter. Paul does the very same thing. Look at Philippians 2 and verse 15. Notice this, folks. Paul says that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in a what? What does it say there? Tell me what it says. Read it for yourself. Notice, he says, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Do you see the direct quote there? Do you see that? How have grown up in the church, or converted years and years, and never have you ever heard a, a, a sermon on Deuteronomy 32. I've been preaching the gospel for over 25 years. I've been a member of the church. I came out of Pentecostalism. Since I was 18, I'm now 49. And I have never once heard one of our brethren deal with Deuteronomy 32. We don't know about it. That's the bottom line. We don't know our eschatology. So here, Philippians 2.15, where is Paul quoting from? Deuteronomy 32. The Song of Moses. Folks, do you see it? I know you see it. When the apostles quoted these things in the New Testament writings, they were quoting from Deuteronomy 32. And it is the equivalent of this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, right? So both Peter and Paul, they call their generation, that is, the first gener the generation that Jesus lived in, Peter and Paul are calling their generation the exact thing that Moses called them in Deuteronomy 32, the very same that Moses used to describe Israel in their last days. You can't get any clearer than that, folks. You can't. And so they were quoting Moses in Deuteronomy 32. They were making application of those prophecies of, of fleshly Israel in their last days, in their generation, not ours. And so the last days, corporate Israel, they had rejected their own Messiah. They had killed the Son of God. And in doing this, they are by their own free will, all the promises that God was going to give them as a nation through their Messiah. And so they were calling Christ a fake, an imposter, a fraud in rejecting Him and thus rejecting the witness of God, right? When you go into 1 John, here John says that if you reject that Jesus has come in the flesh, you're not, you're not only just rejecting Him, you're rejecting the witness that God the Father gave of His Son. And this is what the Jews were doing. They were calling Him a fake and an imposter. And so in calling Him a fake and an imposter, they were, they were rejecting the witness of God the Father. And by that act, they became a perverse and crooked generation. By that act, they were fulfilling the prophecies of Deuteronomy 32. And I put in here from Foy Wallace, anyone who, who can see through a ladder can see through that. Anyone read that from Foy Wallace? I love that quote. <laughs> 
Deuteronomy 32, verses 16 and 17. Notice, God says through Moses, they provoke him to jealousy with foreign gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons and not to God, or not God. Now notice 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 through 22. Paul is going to take his motif from Deuteronomy 32. Paul there says in 1 Corinthians 10 and 20, rather that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. Notice the construction of the words, exactly the same, or almost exactly the same. They sacrifice to demons and not to to God. What do you think Paul had on his mind when he was writing this? Right? Don't you, think, don't you think that Paul had Deuteronomy 32 on his mind? Absolutely. The construction is exactly the same, or near exact. He says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or, now here is the clincher, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Do you see that? I want you to see it. It's exactly Deuteronomy 32, 16, and 17. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Moses said that they would. So here's the application. Look at Revelation 9 and verse 20. There it says the rest of mankind, that's the nation of Israel, by the way, not Rome, who were not killed by these plagues. The plagues was in the siege of Titus in AD 70. It says they did not repent of their works, of their hands, that they should not do what? This is Israel, folks. They should not do what? Worship demons. Do you see that there? Revelation 9 and 20 is a direct quote out of Deuteronomy 32, verses 16 and 17. Israel. Disobedient fleshly Israel should not worship demons. There you have it. There you have it. There is the connection. So this is speaking of the spiritual idolatry the spiritual idolatry of the nation of Israel. Not Rome. Not Rome. When they broke the covenant in rejecting their own Messiah. God accuses them here in Revelation 9 and verse 20. He accuses them of idol worship and the worship of demons in fulfillment of Deuteronomy 32. I want you to see it. So in Hebraic thought, folks, listen. The breaking of the covenant by the, the, their rejection of the Messiah was equal to God as the worship of demons. What's the difference? Right? What's the difference? If you break the covenant, are not, are, aren't you now under the power of Satan? Do you not go back into the realm of the devil or the, the disobedient, the unbelieving? Absolutely. Deuteronomy 32 and 20, God said, I will hide my face from them and I will see what their end will be. Their end. Underline that in your Bibles. Their end will be, for they are a, here we, here we go, they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. Now stay with me, folks. Stay with me. Not only does Peter quote this, and Paul quotes this in Philippians 2, but Jesus quotes this. In Matthew 17, listen to the words of Christ. Look at what he said. He said, Oh, faithless, do you see that? And how long shall I be with you? Do you see that, Je where was Jesus quoting from? Where do you think Jesus got this motif? Where do you think he got it? He got, yes, he got it from Deuteronomy 32. He said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Not very long. Folks, do you see it? I know you do. I want others to see it. Did Jesus just haphazardly pick these words without rhyme or reason, without any meaning, without any thought of application? He just pulled them out of thin air, just decided to use faithless and perverse generation? No, he did not. Jesus got the motif from Deuteronomy 32, and that's where he was quoting from. 
So I'm suggesting that Jesus here spoke with prophetical forethought, with prophetical insight. He was alluding to the Song of Moses in connection with his own nation's eschatological end. That's exactly what he was doing. Amen. Deuteronomy 32 and 21 says, They have provoked me to jealousy. Listen here. But I will provoke them to jealousy. Here's the expansion of the gospel, folks, into the Gentile world. Listen carefully. God says, I will, since they provoke me to jealousy, guess what I'm going to do to them? I'm tit for tat, right? I'm going to provoke them to jealousy. He says, by those who are not a nation. I believe that is the Gentile nations. The gospel expanding in Acts chapter 10 out to the Gentiles and going on further into all of their world. He says, I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. Now Paul quotes this verse in Romans 10 and verse 19. Paul says, but I say, did Israel not know? Or not know because this was, this was told to them by Moses thousands of years ago, centuries ago. First, Moses says, do you see that? Where is Paul quoting from? There's only one place he's quoting from. Only one place in Romans 10, 19 that Paul's quoting from when he says, Moses says. That's Deuteronomy 32 and verse 21. First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy, underline that, by those who are not a nation, I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. That's a direct quote. And yet, why have we not heard a sermon on this for 25, 30, 40 years? How come? Because we don't know our eschatology. Amen. We have no idea what we're talking about when it comes to the eschatological end of the nation of Israel. We have no idea what the last days are referring to. Listen, folks, I get it. We've come out of denominationalism. Now, maybe some of you were born, so to speak, in the Church of Christ. My wife and I were not. We came out of denominationalism. I was a premillennialist. I was a dispensational, dispensational premillennialist. Say that fast three times. When I came out of the Assemblies of God and into the church, that's what I believed. I had to change my point. And then I, I became a all millennial, millennialist. I can't even pronounce that either. And then when I got Foy Wallace's book, I became a partial preterist. So I didn't even know it. And now, here I am. So I've changed my mind several times because I have gradually purged the false doctrine out of my little pea brain that I have. I don't have much left. But I've purged that false doctrine out of my mind and I'm, I'm willing to accept what the Bible teaches. So I get it. I, I understand that our brethren don't know what they're talking about when it comes to eschatology. I am a perfect example of that. I'm a living example of that. They just don't know. We need to help them to see. All right. Let me get down. Lost my point here. Okay. When we look at uh, Romans 10 and also Romans 11, in verse 11. I want us to see, folks, this is a direct quotation by Paul explaining his ministry and apostleship in the expansion of the gospel to the Gentiles. And, I, and Paul expounds on this in Romans 11 and verse 11. He says, I say then, they have, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them, that's Israel, to provoke them to jealousy, you see, that's even tied into Deuteronomy 32 by that word jealousy. Salvation has come to who? The Gentiles. That's what Paul said. It's exactly what Moses said, that he would provoke them to jealousy by a foolish nation. Thus, Old Covenant eschatology is New Covenant eschatology. There's no difference. And so Paul was expounding upon there and really explaining the eschatological plan of God for Israel as it was then at that time unfolding within the scope of his ministry to the Gentiles. And I want us to see that connection there. In Deuteronomy 32 and verse 22, God said, Moses, God through Moses said, for a fire, listen, a fire is kindled 
in my anger. Now this fire here, in my understanding, Holger and Steve, is that this fire is referring to the judgment of AD 70 in the destruction of the nation by the Roman army. And it, he says it shall burn to the lowest hell and it shall consume the earth. I believe, my understanding of that is the land of Israel. It shall consume the land of Israel, the earth. And it will burn to the lowest hell. And so it uh, consumed the earth with her, that being Israel's increase. And Josephus talks about that when, when Vespasian and later on Titus came in, they burned up the land. They burnt, they set everything on fire. And that's exactly what is being spoken of here. That God's in God's anger, uh, it will burn, there will be fire, it will be burned to the lowest hell, and it shall consume the earth, that is the land of Israel, with her, that is Israel's increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Well, we have to realize that Jerusalem was up on one of the highest mountain ranges. It was the mountain range of Zion, the foundation of the mountains of Zion. There were seven hills, by the way, not only of Rome, but also in Jerusalem. So he set the foundation of the mountains on fire. This is 87. There's no doubt about that. And so both John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, allude to this burning fire which shall devour the adversaries of the covenant. Look at Matthew 3, verses 10 through 12 there, where there it says, Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees, and therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The fire. There was a specific fiery judgment that was to come on Israel when? Folks, tell me. In their last days. And this is the fire that John the Baptist was referring to. And so this fire was the fire of judgment where the city would be judged. And here, God would destroy it by the Roman army in AD 7. Now, he says there, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This was John's baptism. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. And I'm going to skip a little bit here. It says, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And I put AD 30, but I, I realize it's from AD 30 to 70 is when the gifts were being worked in the church. But So here, this is, this is talking from Pentecost to AD 70. That's when they had the baptism of the Spirit. The, the miraculous was working during that time. And notice uh, it says there that he will uh, end with fire. I'm sorry, end with fire. Well, this, this baptism of fire, this immersion in fire occurred in, in AD 70. Right? right? Amen. That's what it's talking about. There. And so the, the, I used to think that, hey, I'm going to be baptized in fire. Right? We can't do that today. That's past. That's Pentecostalism. That's what we taught in the assemblies of God. But that's not what um, that's not the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is this fire that John mentions here uh, was the fire of destruction and judgment in 87. It says his winnowing fan, look at this, is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge or clean his threshing floor and gather, underline that, that is the great gathering, by the way. I wish I had another opportunity to speak about the gathering. This is the great gathering of the old covenant. But he will gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up, underline that, burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's AD 70. That's the Jews. So this is speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, folks. And this is the fire that's mentioned again by Jesus in Matthew 22 and 7, in the parable of the wedding. And in that parable of the wedding feast, uh, which is the fulfillment, by the way, of Hosea, uh, chapter 2, verses 19 through 23, by the way, where God would uh, remarry the nation of Israel. Now, in Matthew 22 and 7, uh, this is the parable of the wedding feast. It says, but when the king heard about it. Now, I think there's enough preterists, excuse my language, John. I think there's enough preterists here in this building <laughs> to understand who the king is in Matthew 22. Who's the king? Who's the king? 
The king is God, right? All right. When he heard about their rejection, they would reject coming to the son's wedding. God was angry, right? And he sent out his armies. Who were the armies? Rome, right? And he destroyed those murderers. Who were the murderers? The Jews. They crucified our Savior, did they not? Absolutely they did. And then what they did? Or what, what did God do? He burned up their city. What was the city that was burned? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. There you have it. Notice the connection of Matthew 22 to, Matthew, to Revelation 18 and verse 8. Therefore, her, that's Jerusalem's plagues, not Rome, by the way, will come in one day death and mourning and famine. That is Matthew 24. That's undeniable. And she will be utterly burned with fire, underline that, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. Now, fire and judgment, they go hand in hand. They always have. It's the same motif from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And so the fire and the judgment would come upon Israel in her latter days. And this fire and judgment is connected to one another in relating to Israel in AD 70 and their eschatological end according to the fulfillment of the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. Look at Deuteronomy 32, verses 35 and 36. I'm, I'm almost at the end here. Sorry, folks. Deuteronomy 32, 35 and 36. Moses said, Vengeance is mine and recompense, for the Lord will judge His people. Think about that. How many days of judgment do we have mentioned in, in the New Covenant? What? It would occur in Israel's latter days and her end, in her last days. Now, our all millennial brethren said that there's a judgment here and a judgment there. Uh, E-I-E-I-O, as Hoger uh, said in his debate the other day, right? How many judgments do we have? We only have one end. We only have one judgment of the nation of Israel in which they were burnt up with fire. We don't have many ends. We're not talking about an end here and an end there and an end somewhere else. That's ridiculous. Notice, for vengeance is mine, Deuteronomy 32 and 35 and 36, and recompense, for the Lord will judge His people. That's the Jews. Now the Hebrew writer, whoever he may have been, I believe it was Paul, but I can't prove it. It doesn't matter. But the Hebrew writer quotes this in Hebrews 10 and verse 30. Notice, for we know him who said, quote, vengeance is mine. Where, where does he get that? Deuteronomy 32. Here again, the writer is quoting. I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. That's a direct quote out of Deuteronomy 32, and he applies it to his day and time. Does it apply to us? No, it doesn't apply to us in our day and time. We don't live in the last days. They lived in the last days. So this is a direct quote from Deuteronomy 32. Folks, it, <coughs> excuse me. It's in connection with uh, Hebrews 10.29 as a warning of a much worse or a much sorer punishment, the judgment against those who reject Christ. And then Deuteronomy 32 and verse 43, there Moses said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. This is referring to Christians, the spiritual Israel. For he will avenge the blood of his servants. This is Matthew 23 from Abel to Zechariah, the blood guilt of Israel. And render vengeance to his adversaries. That's the Jews, fleshly national Israel. He will provide atonement for his land and for his people. This occurs, my understanding, this occurs the second coming of Christ in AD 70 in connection with the destruction of the old Jerusalem, the, the bringing down of the new Jerusalem, the church of Christ, God tabernacling with His people, according to Ezekiel 37, Revelation 21. That's my understanding of it. So this is speaking about God's spiritual land, the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God the Father. This is the new Jerusalem, the new mode of life, the new mode of existence under the new covenant, God's spiritual people, His spiritual city, the church of Christ on earth. Now Paul quotes this very verse as a fulfillment 
of the promise made to Abraham in Genesis 12 and verse 3 is the Gentiles were incorporated and adopted into the household of God, that is the church, in and through their obedience to the gospel. That's what that's referring to. In Romans 15 and 10, I promise you I'm winding it. I promise you. In Romans 15 and 10, Paul says, and again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. This is a direct quote from Deuteronomy 35 and verse, I'm sorry, 32 and verse 43. The adoption of the Gentiles into God's family through the promises to Israel was a sign to Israel of the fulfillment of the song of Moses in bringing about the end of fleshly Israel and the transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant in fulfillment of their eschatological end. And I know that was a run-on sentence, but I have to get this in and over with. Now, the avenging of the blood of His servants is addressed in Matthew 23, verses 29 through 36 there, where Jesus speaks about the blood guilt of national Israel. And it would all come upon them in their time and in their day. This, this blood guilt is also mentioned in Revelation 6, verses 10 and 11. There it says, They cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? That is the land of Israel. Not the globe. That is the land of Israel. Right? That is the word gay, right? That's right. Okay. That they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. This is the blood guilt of Israel. Amen. So Revelation 6 goes along with Revela uh, Matthew 23. Revelation 18 and verse 24, and it says, In her, that is Jerusalem, not Rome, was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all of those who were slain on the earth, that is the land of Israel. Not the globe, the land. Revelation 19 and verse 2. It says, For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot, that's Jerusalem, not Rome, who corrupted the earth with her fornication, that's spiritual fornication. And he has avenged on her, that's Jerusalem, not Rome, the blood of his servants shed by her. Now, Deuteronomy 32:43. we're winding down. I'm finally getting my way to the end of the chapter here. Deuteronomy 32 and 43. Moses, God through Moses says, For he will avenge the blood of his servants. Now notice this. Look. And render vengeance to his adversaries. That's unfaithful, fleshly Israel in their last days. This was fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem, not Rome, in perfect harmony with the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. This prophecy is found in Luke 19. I'm not going to read this story because I'm hot, I'm tired, and I'm three hours behind you guys. I'm on California time. I'm not going to read Luke 19. I put in my outline, read the story. I did at home, but we don't have time. Uh, this is, these are the enemies of God. And Luke 19 tells a story there. And so the enemies of God were the Jews. They were fleshly Israel. Old covenant Israel became an enemy of God in the church. Look at Philippians 3. I'm closing. For many, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now even tell you weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. That's 87. And whose God is their belly. That's referring to the dietary laws of the old covenant. And they, they could not have... Uh, and then he says, whose glory is their shame. I think that that's holding on to old, the old covenant in some way, and they couldn't have salvation, uh, and, and they would destroy and dis distort the scheme of redemption if they tried to hold on to the old covenant. So whose glory is their shame? Who set their mind on earthly things, that's the earthly things of the law of Moses, because they were fleshly commandments, according to Hebrews 7, 16, and chapter 9 and verse 10. Now Romans eleven twenty eight. Paul says, concerning the gospel, they, fleshly Israel, are the enemies for your sake. Who are the enemies to be destroyed? Fleshly Israel. Paul says they were enemies. 
for your sake. These were the Jews, the Judaizers. And so from beginning to end, Deuteronomy 32, folks, is profoundly prophetic. As I said before, it is, it is the king of prophetic utterances about the New Testament found in the Old Testament. There is no other chapter in the Old Testament that has as much in it as Deuteronomy 32. And I skipped about 40 hours of um, lecture on Deuteronomy 32. I condensed it. And so as we, we come to a close, and I thank you for bearing with me, Israel had only two choices. And we only have two choices. But they only had two choices. They, one choice was to obey and to be saved, right? Or to disobey and be lost. And if they obeyed, the, uh, they would be part of the remnant that would be gathered into the, the body of Christ, the Lord's spiritual body, the church of Christ on earth. And if they disobeyed, they were to be judged and burned up in the fiery uh, judgment of AD 70 as they would stay in that city. And so this whole prophecy was projected on them, not on us, but on them through the Song of Moses. And it was not for their current time at the time that Moses wrote, but for their latter end. It was for their last days, the last days of Old Covenant Israel. It was a 40-year time period from the ministry of Christ into the destruction of Jerusalem in, in AD 70. And so uh, to wrap this up, the, the way I see it, folks, look, we, we have two choices today. They had two choices then. We have two choices today. We can either be obey the gospel and we can be gathered into the Lord's spiritual body, the church, where the spiritual blessings are, or we can disobey and be eternally lost. And with that, the lesson is yours. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Very good job. I'm so glad that Brent brought all those New Testament references to Deuteronomy 34 as he did. I never forget it. Scott, I'm going to use you, brother. Is that okay? 32. Verse 32. Thank you. No, no, no. Chapter, chapter 34. I'm chapter sorry. 32. Deuteronomy 32. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do that on occasion. But I'm going to use Brother Scott here. I'll never forget when we were first looking at this. And Scott was not on board. He was, he was saying, I'm still looking at these things. And I brought up Deuteronomy 32. I said, it's the most most quoted chapter in the New Testament, Deuteronomy 32, and I said it's talking about the last days of Israel, not the last days of planet Earth, and I went through, and I started telling Scott, this is quoted in Romans 7, this is quoted in Romans 9, this is here, this, and, 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 and I was about halfway through, I had about 20 references, he said, stop, you got me. Yeah. I see now the application in the New Testament made from Deuteronomy 32, and that was, almost, I believe that was maybe, perhaps, at least another little light bulb that has to go on to put it all together. And thank you, Brent, because that is imperative. You're right. We have not studied it. And a good, good lesson. And uh, we need to share these kind great of lessons with great lesson. everyone. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother, for that. And uh, let's take five. At 1125, Sharp, let's be back in our seats. And then Holger uh, will go at that time. So let, we'll take a bathroom break and then... Uh, six minutes, we'll be, we'll be back.
right at that moment and I said, right here is where we need to be. And we placed membership there and I tried to impress upon Hoger at my at that time, I said, I'm as conservative as they come. I mean, I was uh, like John, uh, I, with the non-institutional type, anti-type mentality, I, it was coming out of that. I'm as conservative, and, and, and Hoger said, why? Why do you want to be conservative? He said, why don't we just concentrate on being faithful? And I said, he said, I'm liberal in my love, I'm liberal in my giving, I'm liber liberal in my charity, and I, he just backed me up, and I said, you know what? That right there is the attitude. Right there is what we need. We need to be all things to all men and have this good balance. And I believe Hoger Neubauer exhibits that and everything he does. I have no more confidence in anyone in my life that I'd rather have beside me than Hoger. And he's been there. Brother Hoger, take it over, buddy. I would say turn on the PowerPoint, but... He doesn't do that. <laughs> every, every once in a while, I'll have a PowerPoint. Uh, now, Steve Basin and I uh, give each other a hard time in public and jab each other. But I'll tell you what, I love Brother Steve. He is like my closest brother. Next to the Lord Jesus, I need Steve Basin in my life. And he's been a great encouragement for me. And had it not been for uh, Steve, when I was teaching these things, I was completely ignorant of Facebook and of the Internet and, and the power of that. I just didn't want to deal with it. I mean, I'll write my articles and I'll preach my lessons and I'll talk to preachers. But Steve was all over the place anyway. His, his name was known, uh, my name perhaps known in certain circles of the old guys, um, but uh, Steve was out there. And so the moment, the moment uh, they called me a false teacher, Steve started to speak up. And because I wasn't anywhere on the internet, they couldn't get on me, but they got on Steve. And he fought a battle by himself almost single-handedly for about three or four months until I figured out how to do that uh, get, to get on. And I appreciate him so much. So uh, it's, it's a great blessing for me to be here. I'm thankful to the great God in heaven whose providence has led us to this hour that we think that we're making a difference and we're interested in getting to the truth of God's <coughs> word. Now, for this late morning session, I want to talk about some common objections that you hear from those who try to refute what we are arguing, the fulfillment of all things. And I want to first point to the theme of this lectureship, Romans 15, verse 4. Those things written aforetime, written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, in Churches of Christ, we give a certain deference to that idea. We say, we agree that the Old Testament is for our learning. And you may even have heard something like this, that the New Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You may have heard preachers actually say that. But when it comes right down to it, when recognizing the integral relationship that exists between the Old and New Testaments, they simply deny it. And in fact, that's the problem. Now I want you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 13 with me as we begin our lesson. We're going to hone in on verse 27. Paul is now in Antioch in Pisidia. And he now follows the same pattern of his evangelism. He goes to the synagogue first because he has an obligation to preach to the Jew first and then to the Greek in order because it was their age. I asked Daniel Denham in our first debate, does he go to the synagogue first when he goes into a community? He said it had nothing to do with order. It's all over the scriptures. He enters into the synagogue because they go to the Jew first. It's their age. That's why. And so he stands up in the synagogue 
and there are unbelieving Jews there, he has to meet these Jews. And as Paul is speaking, he points to the fact that Christ has been rejected. Now, these Jews have deference to their rulers in Jerusalem because they're the guardians of the faith. They are the individuals who are the knowledgeable ones. And many of the Jews don't believe their own rulers could possibly be wrong. It's the same problem we have in churches of Christ. We are convinced that the last generation of preachers could not have possibly have been wrong on anything that they said. The eschatology. So Paul now references their leaders. Now look at Acts 13 and verse 27. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers. Oh, we need to wrap our mind around that. Here are some of the most educated, the most significantly powerful men that the Jews would know. To be a ruler, to be a part of the Sanhedrin, to be an individual who ruled over Israel was like one of our Supreme Court judges. They are held in high esteem. And yet he refers to their rulers because they knew him not. They didn't know their Messiah. Amen. They didn't know the great King of Kings and the Lord of Lords when they saw him. Because oh, the voices of the prophets. Look what the Bible says. They knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets. They didn't even know what their own prophets had said. And we can recognize the first coming of Christ because it's too evident not to recognize, but we reject the second coming of Christ because we don't know the voice of the prophets. Amen. And that's exactly the case. And so Paul points out the fact they did not know the voice of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, and they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Now, when discussing this subject with someone that you're trying to introduce the subject to, generally, even among preachers, as you affirm that Jesus returned the second time unto salvation, almost all the time you will hear the objection, but no one knows the day and the hour, right? But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, right? Not the Son, nor the angels, but the Father only, right? Matthew 24, verse 36. Okay. What is generally ignored what generally is not even known is that Jesus is actually quoting, alluding, and referencing Zechariah chapter 14, verse 7. Now, with most preachers in the Church of Christ, when you say that, it's like a shot over their head. Whew. I'm telling you, I don't mean to be unkind. That they haven't ever considered but when Jesus is now in the Olivet Discourse, he's simply citing the fact that the day and the hour of his coming would not be known, so they all would have to watch. Now open your Bible to Zechariah chapter 14, please. Now I'm interested in what Drew Leonard's going to say about Zechariah 14. I think, see, he says this is Rome. Somehow he's talking about Rome here. And the nations are gathered against Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is wrong? I really don't understand. I mean, we're going to have to let him explain his uh, position later on in the debate. Now, Zechariah chapter 14, as a matter of fact, there is a composite whole that you need to begin studying in Zechariah chapter 12. And John quotes from verse 10 of Zechariah 12. Those are those who pierced him. He's referring to the disobedient Jews of that age. During this time, the prophetic office would end because they would be ashamed of every man's vision, Zechariah 13. 
And in this day, when the prophetic office ends, and they would look upon Jesus who was coming, we find that the nations are gathered around Jerusalem. So look at Zechariah 14.1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, and I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Now, I was in debate with Daniel Denham, and he said that similarity of language does not equal identicality of event. No, but when something is so similar and so uh, pointing to the same event, the reason there is similarity is because God is trying to make the same point. We find that the nations are gathering to Jerusalem. What's going to happen in this day? And the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And so there's coming a battle. It's going to be devastating. There's going to be uh, a captivity is, uh, 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 also involved. Now verse 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now, Drew Leonard says, well, that took place after 70. Therefore, we've got a prophecy that goes on after 70. No, Drew. Now we're simply living in the results of what the Lord is doing. We're not saying that the Lord is inactive. We're saying that he is ruling through his line. And every time someone obeys the gospel through this everlasting teaching of the Lord, the Lord's reign is established in that individual's heart. And Jesus has become his king. And that's still going on, but we live in the results of what he has done. And by the way, this is Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15. That Jesus was riding on a horse with a sword out of, out of his mouth, and he would rule over the nations. And so it's that gospel that started small, like a seed, and it increased as it continued to grow. When that gospel was preached to all the world, then the end would come, Matthew 24, 14. That's the end of the age, and then the rule of Christ was established completely all over the earth through the gospel. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches. Now please... Follow me now. Verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and on the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be moved toward the north, and half of it toward the south. There was a preacher in the church by the name of W.L. Oliphant who argued this had reference to the Romans, as they uh, entered in Jerusalem. I'm not necessarily saying that I agree with all of his conclusions, but he defeated a dispensationalist because he argued from Zechariah chapter 14 that he was referring to the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And so when we to the city of Jerusalem, we're heretics. But as long as you don't uh, go with the full end in 70, you might be a great scholar if you're debating a dispensationalist. Now that's inconsistent, but that's exactly the way that we've operated in churches of Christ. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains. They were fleeing in that day, for the valley of the mountains shall reach into Azal. Yea, shall flee like as they fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. Now we need to get our minds around this text. Here we find the Old Testament text that Jesus was coming with his saints. He's referencing the fall of Jerusalem. The judgment would take place. He would come with those saints because Hades was being emptied. And as the heavenly throne is established, there's the gathering together. So in AD 70, what took place was, behind the scenes, invisibly, but I know it took place because God said, that in fact the kingdom was now united. And so when the saints were lifted up and they came with Christ, we sit in the kingdom with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and I'm gathered together with him now in 
in the kingdom of God. And my salvation is complete as theirs is through Christ. That's the idea. Now please notice, verse 6. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. He's referencing the covenants. This is the transition of the covenants. Peter would say in 2 Peter 1 verse 19, Wherefore you do well to take heed, as a light which shines in the dark place, into the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. Christ was coming to dwell in their hearts through his presence. And the darkness was passing, 1 John 2 and verse 8. Now that dark age was coming to an end. And so at the end of the covenant, it was neither light nor dark because the bright and morning star of Christ who was giving salvation wasn't completely yet burning. But he was about to burn in salvation glory. When the Bible speaks about the glory of the Lord, he speaks about the salvation of the Lord. When Isaiah saw his glory, he saw his salvation. That's what it's all about. And we're supposed to see it, which means we experience it. The glory of the Lord. Now please notice in verse 7, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord. That's the text that Jesus is quoted from. Daniel did a terrific job last night on the feast days. The feast of the trumpets. A day not known. This is the last trumpet. And so they had to look for the signs. The Hebrews would go from the mountaintop looking for the signs in the heaven. And then the trumpets were blown. The day had arrived. Jesus is not now in the Olivet Discourse dividing us his lesson into talking about the end of Judaism and now he's going to talk about the end end. Right. <laughs> Which is just ridiculous. It's simply Hebrew parallelism. He's speaking about the end of the age and no one knew the day and the hour because it was one day which shall be known to the Lord. Not day nor night but it shall come to pass at an evening time it shall be light. And that is the day in which the day was about to dawn. Now look what happens in verse 8. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem. Now salvation is complete. The living waters of salvation, the river of life restored from Daniel 12, 5 and 6. It is now in its completion. So half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea in summer and winter it shall be. Now the seasons have changed so to speak. It is different than it's been before and now the distinction that you knew between land and sea are no more. It's like Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 and there was no more sea. You know, <laughs> I was talking to a preacher and he's a good guy. He, he's talked to me for a couple hours now. And, 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 I, and we're, we're talking probably four or five hours all together. I think the last conversation we had about an hour talk. So we're talking about the new heavens, the new earth, but the former heavens and the former earth are now passed away and there was no more sea. Okay? And I asked him, if that's future heaven, and if the earth had passed away, obviously there'd be no, no more sea, right? If there's no more earth and the sea is in the earth, there's no more sea, why does the Lord say no more sea? But in prophetic texts, the sea has reference to the Gentiles. The Jews lived in the land, the land of Palestine. So you have the land, the earth. Okay. The Mediterranean Sea is where the Gentiles approach the land. So for a Jew to live in the land... And outside is the sea. There's always a distinction between them out there in the sea, us in the land. And what happened in 70, because the old covenant ended finally, that God broke down the distinction. So the Jewish qualms were over. The law was over. The condemnatory covenant was gone. And the freedom in Christ remained so that salvation was complete. 
And so that a Jew and a Gentile have exactly the same standing before God. So God will be all in all. That's exactly what he was bringing about. Now, please notice. Verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all of the earth in that day. Now I can just see members of the church of Christ and the average preacher and their wheels turning. Are you not saying that Jesus was not king in Acts chapter 2? Clearly he is crowned. Clearly he's a king. That's it. My brethren in churches of Christ, and I know all about them. I are one of them, okay? I know exactly how we are trained. We're trained to think specifically. Particular times. Particular ideas. Memorize the passage. Refute the idea. Now, we get the already in churches of Christ. We don't have a clue about the not yet. It is not a different kind of kingdom and rule that Jesus is speaking about in Luke 21, 31. When Jesus says, When these things come to pass, know ye the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. He's not talking about a different nature of the kingdom that began on Pentecost. Did not Jesus say the kingdom of God is like unto a mustard seed? Right? In Matthew 13, right? 31 and 32. Did it not grow? Was the kingdom not growing? Did it not become a great tree? Did not the uh, leaves represent, uh, 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 leaves expand and the birds come into its branches? Does that not have a great picture, a wonderful picture of the Gentiles coming in? So the kingdom is now expanding. And so when the gospel is preached to all of the world, the rule of Christ could be established. So it's an important idea to see the evangelism that took place in the entire world in order that Christ could rule. Now we formulated a doctrine in Churches of Christ which makes God a tyrant. Because if the law ended at the cross, at that moment for everyone, Every Jew or Gentile born the next day without the gospel has gone to hell. Has to be, according to their doctrine. That's right. It's done away. No, no. The law will be destroyed by means of the cross, but not at the cross. Only as they had availability to it were they judged by it. That's why Paul goes into the synagogue there in Acts 13 and says, you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Read that text with me if you don't mind. And if you've got your Bible in front of you, and even if you do mind, you've got to read it with me. All right. All right, look at verse uh, 43. Now when the, Acts 13, 43. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who was speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Have we not read these texts? That they must have been in the grace of God in order to continue in the grace of God? All right, let's keep on going. Verse 34. And the next day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Okay, now they got the problem. Now it's being revealed to them. Look what happens in verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God first should be had spoken to you. Necessary. He spoke to the Jew first. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. It wasn't simply a matter of influence. It wasn't simply a matter, yes, it's a good place for him to go. No. He had to go to the Jew first, then to the Greek. But seeing you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. We see judgments increasing. And so, as the gospel is extending, judgment is extending. The kingdom is extending. And one day when the old law is done away, and there's an equality in covenant. Jesus is going to rule as king over all the earth. But he wasn't going to do that until the gospel was made available to them. All right. We've got a picture of Palestine. Okay. I asked. I have a good brother 
um, in Virginia. He doesn't talk to me anymore, calls me a heretic. But I asked him on the page, all right? You got Jerusalem down here, all right, in, in, in the southern kingdom. You got Jerusalem and Judah, okay? What if you had a 95-year-old Jew in Dania, okay, couldn't get to Pentecost, can't, he can't travel anymore, all right? He, he, he allowed a transition between uh, the cross and Pentecost, but at the Pentecost, everybody's lost. I said, so suppose he dies the next day. Suppose he dies, all right? And he couldn't make it to Jerusalem. Are you telling me he's lost? He said, yep, yeah, yeah, he's lost. What kind of nonsense have we come up with? What have we made our, our gospel into? A gospel of condemnation or a gospel of salvation? It's ridiculous. And by the way, if I seem like I'm a little bit, you know, bothered by some of these brethren, <laughs> you can study with me, and I want to be even-minded, and I want to be kind and gentle and compassionate. But when you call me a heretic, you better stand up and answer. If you cause the division with your false doctrine, not me. Sorry that you're ignorant of these things. As I have been, all right, I, I, I'll agree. These things caused me some concern for a while. A little bit shame of myself that I didn't press on myself to, to understand them, but some of my, my, I guess some of my brethren acted like I did. How can we be wrong? And it occurred to me, have you ever studied with the Methodists before? Well, the whole Methodist church can't be wrong, right? You studied with the Catholic, the whole Catholic church can't be wrong. You study with the average preacher in the Church of Christ, you know what he thinks? Well, well, Nichols couldn't have been wrong. We can't be wrong. Oh, yeah, you can be wrong. We all can be, so let's be open to the Word of God. And before you sweep out your garage, you got to open up the door. Right? Amen. Yeah, so now Zechariah 14, let's go on. So now in verse 11, and there shall uh, dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction. Wow. No more utter destruction. Now salvation. If that's not a microcosm and then the piece of the tabernacles of the book of Revelation, I don't know what is. This is the Olivet Discourse. This is what Jesus is referencing. Now, uh, I'm going to go about 15 minutes, Steve. Okay. Okay, until quarter after that gets enough time to eat and then for the debate as well. <clears throat> So I'm not going to announce the end and then, um, not end. Uh, Brent had more ends in his lesson than the futurists do in their, in their doctrine. So uh, um, I want you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, 9 through 11. Now, this is a text which the futurists think is theirs. It's not. It's ours. Because there's only one second coming. One, only one coming again, actually, is the, the language in Scripture. And Jesus is referencing that coming. All right? So, as he was coming again, he promised, or it was promised, that he was going to come in like manner as they had seen him go into heaven. So that's one in verse 9. The Bible says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received them out of their sight. Now there's the key. There's the key to the text. The cloud. Throughout the scripture, the cloud was the means by which God communicated when his presence was not seen, but his voice was heard. So in Exodus chapter 19, he spoke through a thick cloud. Exodus 34, to Moses, through the cloud. Matthew 17, 5, through the cloud. They didn't see him, but they knew his presence was there. He was in the cloud. And so think about a cloudy day. I mean a thick, cloudy day. Okay? And the clouds are low. And you hear... A jet plane go over. Now you know it's there, right? You just can't see it, all right? So the cloud comes and covers Jesus. 
That's the motif. That's the theme of Scripture. The cloud comes, right? Now, if a cloud came and shrouded me right now, and my voice was speaking, you would know that I'm here. I'm still here. You just saw me a moment ago. But now you don't see me. Why? I'm in the cloud. And the cloud took him up. So the disciples watched Jesus in the cloud. They didn't see him anymore as he was going into heaven. Now, they can't see him anymore, but they know his presence is there. Ye men of Galilee, all right, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? You shouldn't do that. The future is saying that's what you should do. Look for him. Are you looking for him? No, don't do that. Because you'll know his presence is there when he'll come. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall come in like manner as you have seen him go. They knew his presence was there. They didn't see him. When the parousia would come, they would know he was there that they couldn't see him. That's the idea. And I'm just sorry. The ring of truth should have the ring of truth with everyone. And to tell you the truth, that's the ring of truth. And I know that's exactly what he is saying. So he was coming in the clouds. Now, uh, I skipped up, skipped around a little bit. But I want you to go to Matthew 24 right now. So the day and the hour is a quotation from Zechariah 14, verse 7, Matthew 24, 36. There is no division in the text. That's made up in the minds of the futurists. He's talking, uh, the disciples have asked, Matthew records three questions, right? So, when shall these things be? What about the fall of the temple? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And by the way, the coming here is singular. The parousia is the Greek word. The sign of thy coming. The coming would be and of the end of the world or the end of the age. But Matthew only records Matthew's perspective. I want you to look at Mark chapter 13. Look at verse 4. Same thing in Luke 21, 7. Tell us, when shall these things be? Look at the plural things. Okay? And what shall be the sign when all these things, all these things, shall be fulfilled? Here, This is mellow in the infinitive. So the disciples are asking, when will all these things come to pass? Or when will it be that they will all... Uh, when we'll all be near about to come. All right? Jesus tells them about all those things. Now notice in verse 32. But of that day and the hour knoweth no man. You see what he's saying? All things that he's speaking about, yet the day and the hour they didn't know. Well, someone says it's going to be like the days of Noah. And there's no signs in the final coming of Christ. I was talking to Drew Leonard. I wish Drew was here. Couple, and uh, I said, Drew, I said, is it going to be like the days of Noah with, and without signs, right? And he said, yes. I said, did, did, did Noah build something called an ark? That's really a mysterious Bible doctor. Never, nobody ever heard of